Hi, um, so if you can really hear me at the back, just tell me and then I'll try to speak uh, loudly. Uh, so if you want to have the link to the paper, they're all listed in the end lines, you can click on the paper here. And um, so what's the main problem that um, this paper addresses is that many people could you speak up a bit? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, so many people <coughs> talk about uh, neural networks as black boxes, as uh, we can fully interpret why they make certain decisions and uh, how, um, basically, why they are doing what they are doing. And this problem has been uh, talked about quite a lot. And if you compare that to decision trees, for example, they are fully interpretable, so you can fully trace why the decision is made. And as neural networks are being used in autonomous cars and uh, medical applications, we want to have more understanding of what's actually happening inside. And this is what this paper set out to do. Um, and it made quite a big impact on the field uh, in terms of um, its citation. So it was cited about 300 um, times and um, it was quite widely publicized in sort of popular science um, magazines as this one. This is quite a good article about what the paper is about and it's very uh, friendly so and it even has a, a cool picture to it as well. So if we get to the paper itself. It's called opening the black box of neural networks with information. And, uh, the author of this paper is uh, Naftali Tishbin who is a professor of information theory and uh, statistical learning in uh, University of Jerusalem. He's been working in the field for quite a long time. And uh, in 2015, he created an uh, sort of outline that we can uh, use information to try to understand neural networks. And in this paper, he fully implements this idea and uh, does some experiments that we will look at. And so the two basic um, contributions that he suggests in this paper makes is um, that first of all, we can visualize uh, the, um, the insights of the neural network using an information plane. Uh, it's on an information plane which shows the uh, basically what kind of information the network knows about the data set. So that's both the inputs and your labels. Uh, and another way to look at it is basically how would information flow through the neural network during the process of training it. And in, when we talk about information here, it's purely information theory uh, concept. It's very, very basic. Um, and um, they come to um, some conclusions that uh, using that, we can see that there are um, two phases of uh, behavior while training a neural network. First, one of them is fitting, and the other one is compression. And uh, both of these phases are signified uh, by the, the amount of uh, the information that the neural network holds about the data set. <coughs> so when the network is fitting to the data set, it increases the information that it knows about the data, and then their main discovery is there is a compression phase where actually the network goes, starts to forget the information about the data set and does so very actively. And this compression phase takes most of your training time because the fitting phase is quite small and then 80 or 90 percent, I think, in this particular case, their network was compressing the information rather than trying to gain new information about the data. Um, and the way how they identify the compression as opposed to fitting is by looking at the um, stochastic gradient um, errors that flow on the backward step. And so this is signified by the difference of the means of these errors and their uh, variance. And we will look at that further on in the, um, their discovery. And, so, and there's also a nice way to visualize all of these things using um, information as well. Uh, but um, another main point is that 
when they studied uh, the information flows of neural networks, they saw that the information inside the networks converge to a information bottleneck, which is a um, very beautiful idea from information theory. Uh, by no coincidence, it was also uh, proposed by Tilbin, the same author of this paper, in um, 1999. Uh, and it's quite widely uh, used tool in information theory. And we'll take a small detour and look at that paper as well. So, um, information bottleneck as itself is uh, pure information theory stuff. And basically what it allows us to do is um, to try to to estimate the relevance of information in one signal about the other signal. Because relevance is something that we can only get from if we have two signals. If we just have one signal, we need something for it to be relevant to. So, um, an information bottleneck is kind of a very efficient representation of uh, relevance from one signal to another. So, the example that they give here that I quite like is that uh, a typical example is that of speech compression. One can consider a loss is compression, but in any compression beyond the entropy of speech, uh, some components of the signal can be, cannot be reconstructed. But then on the other hand, a transcript of a spoken word uh, has much lower entropy uh, than the acoustic waveform, which means that it is still possible to compress further without losing any information about words and their meaning. So, we preserve all the relevant information in that sense, even though we lose quite a lot of other information that is not relevant. And so in this context, you can say that the transcript is a information bottleneck between uh, raw audio and what the person is saying. And one of the uh, conclusions of the information bottleneck paper, that opening the black box that we're talking about, is that actually neural networks without any form of regularization, find these bottlenecks and implement them inside by doing compression. So first of all, they look at the data and then they say, okay, we don't really need all of this data. We're gonna throw some of the irrelevant stuff away and only compress it to the most efficient form. Uh, and they uh, go on to say that uh, this can be the mechanism behind um, the absence of overfitting that we see in deep learning, as these models are widely overparametrized, but they are able to generalize because um, they find these deficient comp uh, compressions, and they are actually not using um, all of their classes. So we can see them saying this. Yes. This compression. Uh, um, occurs by stochastic gradient descent without any explicit regularization of sparsity and usually is largely responsible for the absence of all fitting in deep learning. Since deep learning doesn't really underfit, then that is kind of an implied way of saying that this is why deep learning generalizes. Um, but when we say that you know information passing through a neural network and all of that, we are actually talking about quite a specific concept from uh, information theory, uh, neutral information. Um, can I have like a show of hands who... Um, sure. How many are familiar with neutral information like the actual memories? So, okay. Um, I'll go through some detail about that. Um, so, 